this is a Mirakami Minute presented by the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast. Hear the wind sing. Let's talk about it. Yes. I am your delightful host, Caleb James, with me today, as always, for these Mirakami Minutes. Spencer Church, how are you doing, sir? All right. Yeah, yeah, just all right. All right. Like this book, all right. All right. Just all right. I would like to go into a great detail on this book, but you can't. No, you really can't. This isn't really a novel. It's uh, We described most of our feelings, I think, in the introduction about, you know, the interesting parts, which was him actually writing, mm. uh, Mirakami writing this book, but the actual book itself, not too interesting. The basic premise is a college kid is home for, and I think he lives in like a seaside town. There's a lot of beach stuff, but he's home for summer vacation, I believe it is and or winter vacation i think it's summer right i think it's yeah it seems like i got summer. a summary vibe yeah, yeah it's def- well they're at the beach definitely summer it's essentially he's home from vacation and it's just broken up into countless anecdotes of i don't know if it's just his thoughts or his life but most of it is spent at jay's bar where he drinks a lot with his buddy the rat uh this is the first of the rat trilogy the second one which we'll be covering next is pinball 1973 and what we really should cover, which I actually already read because I didn't know this was a trilogy, mm. uh, was The Wild Sheep Chase. Wild yeah. Sheep Chase is really good. That's like a novel. This is a novella, and it is, like I said, not a narrative. Yeah. Because also, too, not only do we get, like, we get chunks of, like, the unnamed narrator, we also get chunks of, like, the rat and, like, yeah. different, you know, too. Which were, the rat's by far the most interesting mm. character, but he's only in it partly. And then there was like there was some parts with like a news person. Yeah. And well going back to the rat though, like the rat, why he's interesting is because he seems to be uh Mirakami's philosophical mouthpiece, mm-hmm. if you will. So Which coming from a guy named Rat is yeah, great. Which uh, the, it's a young guy who is rich but he shuns rich people. Well, his parents are rich, so it makes him rich by proxy. But he shuns rich people and he at the beginning of the book he doesn't even read or anything, but then our narrator, who's your comedy, yeah, uh, loves reading, and then he 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 makes an off offhand comment to the rat about reading. Essentially, I think something along the lines of just making him feel bad. And then all of a sudden, he sees the rat like a couple weeks later, or something. And he's been reading all these ridiculously hard yeah. Henry James novels and stuff. And it's like okay, so he just went hardcore into it. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to write a novel. Yeah. But if you want to see like Mirakami's thoughts on stuff at the time period, the rat's your character to uh, really pay attention to. Uh, our narrator, again, unnamed narrator who loves jazz music, classical. It's this book surprisingly from the very jump, you know, from Jump Street here has every trope of Mirakami. Yeah. There's discussions of cats, there's a scene with wells, there's jazz music, classical music, eating pasta, making food, eating food, jazz bar. What about a uh, beer? Drinking beer shows up a lot. Because I know like in this story, and like I've started the second story, beer is always like uh, they're doing something there, he's having a, a beer big... and a cigarette. If you Yeah, just smoking is a big one in these older novels especially. One, Well, smoking still big in Japan, but one thing you'll notice about Mirakami's work, which I think is why so many people either hate it or they really, really like his work, what he does with the things of just like the ritualistic beer drinking, cigarette smoking, he writes it in a way where it's almost hypnotic. Yeah. And I think people really relate to that because, you know, what do you see most people doing after they eat or something if they're smokers? They light one up. Mm-hmm. What do you see people who, you know, are not maybe alcoholics, but they, they like drinking, what do they do with dinner? They drink a mm-hmm. beer or just the act of pouring, because he always points it out, the act of pouring a beer. Later novels, it's more, as I think Mirakami became a little more sophisticated, it's like the fancy whiskeys and the highballs and like making cocktails. Uh, he does the same thing with music. He goes way in depth into the music. To it, not so much in this book. I mean, he discusses the music, and but a lot of his novels, he goes into the, like uh, the classic authors. Mm-hmm. Uh, how would you consider classic composers? Yeah. The classic composers of the music and the modern composers that play it, or whatever version that's being played in in the novel or the story he's telling. And what he often does is he will compare multiple composer like you'll have one composer say beethoven just for because that's who i know yeah and say so that's the only bad thing is like i don't, don't know he, any when, of these yeah dudes. when he gets into that stuff i have, I have no idea who they could be fake i don't yeah. know but what he likes to do in his work is he will discuss uh usually too long ad nauseum here he will discuss the whatever rendition that he likes of this uh, composition and he'll go into what person 
does that or what band or whatever, but then he'll like have another one and compare it to someone else. So you'll get like three or four different, I don't, I don't know what you would consider them. Cause I don't think they, I mean, I guess they could be composers as well, but whoever, cause I'm not in the classic, mm. same with the jazz too. Like he does that with jazz jazz. I could be a little more understandable. So, you know, he'll compare a, a Charlie Parker song with a miles Davis. That's a bad example. But like, you know, he'll compare different uh, musicians that are playing the same exact song. Uh, when we covered, I think it was first person singular, uh, or maybe the elephant vanishes. We covered one where we actually looked up the music. I remember. Yeah. I don't yeah. remember exactly what it was, but it was such a big detail in his story. But he does that with music. He does that with cars as well, but not to uh, such a strict degree. It's usually like just the description of the car model, the make, year, and the, like the transmission or whatever. The you know who's driving it. He always points out these details, but I think he does it because it makes you go, oh, yeah, I could, it's, it's more real because mm-hmm. that's how I live my life. I pour my beer like that. Mm. Or, you know, I like a frosted glass with my beer, and so does this character. It's always those subtle uh, nuances that he brings to his work that I really enjoy. Uh, but again, that turns a lot of people off because they're like, get to the story. Yeah. This story, which is not a story, mm-hmm. that never gets to it. Though there is somewhat of a narrative where... It's more kind of like a slice of life kind yeah. of thing. The main thing about this, which I found interesting, because the basis of the story is it's this young college guy. He finds a girl passed out in the bathroom, and she's missing a pinky or something, like missing a finger. I think it's a pinky. Yeah. I'm not going to give any spoilers to this. Again, it's not. It's kind of hard to spoil because it's not really a story, but there is things that can be spoiled. So I'm not going to go into the character or their interactions here, but it almost... You think it's going to turn into either a love story or what Mirakami usually does, like a missed opportunity story Mm -hmm. or a lost love or something like that. Uh, He touches on that. But I think the thing that really stuck out to me was you have all these characters in this who are presented as kind of witty, sophisticated, even though they're young, uh, maybe a bit naive because they're young, kind of feeling their way through the world. But they also have this nonchalance about them, like they just don't really care one way or the other how things unfold but then what mirakami does so well is near the end of the story he brings it out where it's like oh there's the emotion Mm. and then you see like the characters break down and actually do care and it's just this face uh this false exterior that they're putting on like this front uh we'll use the girl for example there's a scene that's a little heavy near the end and through this whole thing it's like she doesn't give a shit about anything and then you're like no she just like has some problems yeah she has some major problems she which is always hinted at or alluded to but i think of it as like people who are severely depressed always making funny depression jokes Mm. or suicide jokes or things like that where it's like oh yeah that's just roy he just always is saying things like that but then like you kind of suspect like nah he's like it's he's making it funny but i think deep down that guy's got problems that's how the characters in the mirakami works always come out it's like you know there's deeper issues uh, I'll be interested when we read Pinball 1973 if it's a direct follow-up because I don't know much. I didn't read anything about it yet. But I want to see like if he touches on those themes a little, like maybe goes more in depth. Because like I said, this isn't a story. No. Did you find it weird? or I? Because like, in the last episode, we talked about the um, the introduction of the story. And, yeah. and talking, Mirakami talking about like just how he started writing. But after that, there was also like another mini introduction that felt like. Yeah. But because I, I couldn't tell if that was like still from Mirakami or if that was the, you know, the unnamed narrator in the story. Or I thought, well, maybe that was maybe like the original introduction whenever the thing first came out. And maybe the thing that we talked about last issue was like a newer. Well, remember I said I had trouble figuring out if it was supposed to be set in Japan at first. Yeah. Because it didn't really give any kind of details that I noticed. So I think, so this opening is from the point of the narrator. As a writer, I'm thinking because the way this story ends, it ends with uh, the narrator when he's like 28, 29. Mm -hmm. I think he's married, maybe has kids. I don't remember, but it ends with that. So maybe that's how the beginning is. And we just either missed or I don't think there was like a set jump to like going back in time. You just start talking Mm -hmm. about, uh, like I said, it was like at first I was like, why did they publish this? Like when they read this at the beginning, because it's so disjointed. It's not like a cohesive plot or anything. So I think maybe at the beginning it was the adult narrator reflecting back, but we weren't told that there was a mm. you know reflection. It just you get thrown into the story because he does that a lot through here. Is where 
like when he's talking about his different his girls he slept with in his life, mm-hmm. he just will jump back into like talking about them, and then the next part's just like either now or something else. Like I said, it really reads like that uh, one Henry Rollins book, I, his first book I had, where it's just like a bunch of anecdotes, but it's not a cohesive plot by any means. This, I mean, does follow a progression. So you can read this and go, well, time's moving. Mm-hmm. It's but, leading to something. But it's more along the lines of one's own recollection and reflections of events in their life. But it doesn't read like a story of a 29-year-old reflecting on his youth. Mm. It reads like a youth who just suddenly is 29. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just, that's more of the amateurish uh, nature of Mirakami is obviously not a writer. Just this is the first thing he ever wrote. If it didn't get published, he said he wouldn't, he just would have gave up. So, good thing they published it. Yeah, them. right. Overall, I think I rated this a four. And that, again, that was probably because I was reading more into the subtle nature of the character's emotions. And I, I, I like the life, the slice of life stuff, too. Mm-hmm. But, because he's, he, does, he does do a, a really good job of when he is talking about the slice of life stuff. That it somehow still like draws you in. Yeah. Somehow. I never found at any point during this I was bored or wanting to hurry up with it or anything. Mm. I enjoyed what I was reading. It held my attention. Uh, well, you read it in like a sitting. Yeah, I read it in like an hour or something. It wasn't that, like I said, it's not very long. It was 100 pages or something. Yeah. But it's a mere commie and it reads faster than 100 pages. Also, the text in this book's not very and, small, and, it, and it's and they get a lot of breakups and stuff yeah. in the uh in like in the chapters. There's multiple breakups. You don't get like one giant paragraph or pages or anything like that. And the dialogue is good. Yeah, retrospection, maybe I would give it a three, three and a half, but I'll stick with my four. I'll see how the pinball 1973 treats me. But like I said, I enjoyed it. It reminded me. You know what it reminded me of? There's a show I really like called Midnight Diner. It's a yeah. Japanese story. I don't know if you ever watch it. Or Japanese show. But it's just set in a diner, and it's literally just every episode is just a slice of life story of one of the patrons. Sometimes the chef himself. And I really enjoy it because it's not like there's... It doesn't matter if that makes sense. There's, like, no, it's not, cl- there's no conflict. It, well, even if there's conflict in the lives of whoever you're witnessing, mm. it doesn't affect you, and there's no real consequence to anything. Like, this isn't a story, like when we read Quinn Locker Babies by the other Mir- Ryu Mirakami... Like the world pretty much is going to end, right? Or yeah. something like that's a big consequence. Uh, you're like, holy shit! This if this narrator never meets the girl again, or he doesn't talk to his friend the rat again, or anything, like it doesn't matter. None of this is really important. Even in their lives, it's just like it would almost be like reminiscing about high school and just like, yeah, I had this one teacher who was really cool, and I enjoyed talking to him, and they were a good teacher. But if like who, if you wrote that, you could write that in an engaging way that the audience would be like oh that's a cool character that teacher i'd like to learn more but if you never felt like it never showed up again in the book you'd be like yeah oh well like, that doesn't it doesn't really matter that's like the whole story here it doesn't really matter but it's just enjoyable to watch it's like watching like a sunset or just sitting outside and listening to the birds sing it's enjoyable it's relaxing and it doesn't require much of you a lot of times people really like literature that it requires a lot from the reader and that's the only way you're going to enjoy it is you get into it and you're like, oh, I got to take notes. I got to focus. Mirakami doesn't do that in this book. Like Kafka on the Shore, yes. 1Q84, I would say a little bit. That has some deeper elements. Um, Wind Up Bird Chronicle, yeah, I would say that requires some uh, real attention from the reader to really get a good grasp on what they're, you know, what they're partaking in. But this, no. Well, I did see one thing because I was I was watching some stuff because since I finished reading it, uh, you know, I think it was sometime last week I wanted to try to re-familiarize myself. And I did hear, like, one guy in a video I was watching, he did mention how, like, he thought how it did kind of show, like, uh, Mirakami's, like, uh, points of view on things during that time period in Japan. Like, with just, like, the, um, just kind of, like, the nonchalantness of, of yeah. things. And, like, young people during that time, you know, of that generation during, during that time of... Well, what I gathered, like I already said about like the rat's philosophical musings is kind of, I'm assuming Mirakami's point of view on things uh, more along the lines of greed, academics, just different things like that. Not not very deep. It doesn't no. go too super deep because that character is really not in the story very much. What does go, it, he touches on, like you said, you brought up a good point with his nonchalance. The characters are a good example of Mirakami's feelings. I'm assuming again, you know, we can't yeah. we only speak in generalities here. 
I'm assuming his feelings on things like the protests that were going on, because you're thinking, what, Mirakami was in his 30s? Probably. Early 30s, I yeah. think he said when he wrote this and stuff. So he's viewing like the student protests that were sweeping across Japan at the time. I would also imagine this was not too long after the Vietnam War, whereas Japanese wasn't in the Vietnam War, they still, everyone's affected by war, yeah. you know? So I'm sure they had feelings on that. And plus, a post World War II Japan, how they feel about the Americans invading, you know, mm -hmm. Vietnam, supposedly. So I'm sure he had a lot of feelings on those things and a lot of opinions, but he touches on them in this nonchalant way with his characters where he's actually writing from the perspective of the college age student who went to some of these mm -hmm. protests and went over to see the kid do it. He was finding some chick to nail, yeah. some hippie chick that he ended up boning. He didn't seem to care about the protest. And I think that's Mirakami's view. It's like, I'm too old to care about the protest. What can I? What story can I tell set with the protest? Oh, guy meets a girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you probably, I would imagine 19, or yeah, Pinball 73 is going to have some, uh, I would have, I mean, you started reading, is it right, does it read the same, broken up in anecdotes, or is it more of an actual story so far? Um, It's broken up, it's a little, it seems to be a little bit more linear, uh, not linear, but uh, linear, linear than, uh, than this one, to where uh, it is, it's, Everything's kind of moving forward. Mm. Uh, it still is kind of pretty slice of life ish, but uh, like I said, well, you definitely get more of the rat. That's so, good. So if you are the fan, if you are a fan of the rat, when we do Wild Sheep Chase, I might actually just reread that because yeah. I can't for the life of me even remember if the obviously the rat has to be involved. Just not reading these first two, and I read that one, I wouldn't have known any of the characters, you right. know. Well, even whenever I because uh, before I bought because I I just bought that the other day at the bookstore. And I wanted to make sure, because I remember you telling me one the, the trilogy, Yeah. but I, I wanted to double check because I thought that was the right one, but I wanted to make sure, so I looked it up and it said, you know, the third in the in the Rat trilogy, but it says that you don't have to really... It doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, I remember really enjoying that book, and it was more of a, from what I remember, like a mystery, like an unsolved mystery, kind of a detective story without a detective. Nah. Uh, it, fucking weird. <laughs> It, that's obviously the first because this doesn't have any magical realism in it i'd imagine the pinball one doesn't but no the only the only thing was what was that like uh was it a that, that like weird dream with like the mine on the mines on mar or on the yeah and like something? the wells or something the wells yeah that was the only time that it ever really got kind of weird but it, it was a dream yeah. it wasn't set in any kind of reality but that yeah that's where you had the, and that was really cool i forgot that you actually did want to mention that because is it a book one of the characters read or is it an actual dream? I couldn't remember if it was, I don't remember if it was a story the character read or the, the rat read or something. Regardless, yeah. it's about a guy who goes on Mars and it's essentially like a time travel story without time travel. If you go into these giant wells on Mars and you climb and go out through the other side, uh, you went through like thousands of years mm -hmm. or something. Like it, it's, it's wild, but it's one of those things like, that reminded me almost of um, a Vonnegut type of deal. Kind of, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's what he's going for. Uh, I would have really liked to see his literary influences going into his first ever novel. I know he said he read a lot of Russian literature and stuff, but I'd like to see if he read some of the goofy like sci-fi and things like that. And he also kind of makes me want to like dive deeper in the history of like Japan during that you know during the time yeah. periods of his to see if you can get any more context or just like you know the the feeling of what how what the stories are set in. Well, Mirakami became a writer during one of the most interesting periods in Japan because, like I said, post-World War II, that's when he grew up. Yeah. So that's where he gets a lot of his ex life experience from. And then when Japan reestablishes itself, he's growing up in, you know, like I said, post-Vietnam, during the student protests, and then you had all the weird shit going on in the 80s. And then the 90s, they had, like, the big economic bubble burst. Like, it, Japan, their economy crashed, all this shit. That's something we'd have to look more into, but like him, Ryu Mirakami, like these guys are, were writing from a very interesting perspective. Now, the, you mentioned it a little bit ago when I went to the protest, and like it's just it's it's weird. It's something that you, you like you you and like yeah okay it makes sense that they're there, but like I never imagined like a Japanese hippie. Yeah. Before like oh they existed, especially like in Japan, but yeah like you know what I mean. That's just a weird like. You know, you you used to like these, like are they Woodstockian? Like you know well, what I mean. In this story, as well as any of the stories I've read set around this period, they all listen to the Beatles yeah. and the Rolling Stone. 
Japan was very westernized in their media. Well, the Beach Boys. The Beach, Beach Boys, Boys yeah. was the main thing in this first book. And I always wondered, though, when I read these, because like we discussed in the introduction, Mirakami's writing is very western. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't come off as Japanese, like the characters kind of do, but not the stories or the way they're told. So I'm wondering if it's just him that's into all this western music yeah. and stuff. Do you think like the regular Japanese person at that time period was listening to the Beach Boys? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm sure there's probably some, but probably at the again, probably yeah. the student generation that around the time, but I don't know. Uh that's something I, we would have to look up. Like, I wonder if that's what he was playing at the bar that you know him and the wife was Oh, was, he was. He was. Oh, wouldn't that be interesting? Like you had like a you know, you could go uh Back in time for something good to go back to. Yeah, it was a bar, right? That him and the white jazz bar. Yeah, yeah, the jazz bar. Wouldn't that be cool? I'm pretty sure it was called Peter Cat. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the name of it. But wouldn't that be cool to go back to go back to that time before he, you know, started writing and you know go to his bar? I watched a mini documentary on YouTube years ago, and this is something we should do. Actually, I think it was a Japanese news documentary thing they ran. But there's something called like a Mirakami pilgrimage where like Mirakami fans go over there and they go to all his old haunts. They go to his barber shop. They go to his old jazz bar. Just whatever like places that he was. Almost like when I went to Maine and they had all these Stephen King spots. I was like, oh, shit. I accidentally went to like where he wrote. I I don't know if I think it was Carrie or one of the fucking books he wrote. It was like a diner or something. Like I kept accidentally going to play because it was Bangor. It's a very small place, though. Unlike Tokyo, <laughs> but uh, I would imagine uh, Mirakami's was probably a little cooler. But isn't it weird though? The more we talk about them, like the more like they're like so similar but different with Mirakami and Stephen King. Yeah, like they, it's like those diagrams, like those Venn mm. diagrams, like the the the, the circle in the middle that connects them is, is is very like has a lot more in common than what you'd kind of think in at first glance. But they though they still have like these polar opposites that make them their own individual. And Mirakami also has a habit of being able to write the most horrific scenes that I've ever read, <laughs> and they don't read horrific. Yeah. You're just like, oh, like you read it, like, because there's like, an, uh, I think it's 1Q84, actually. There's a scene, I think it's like a flashback to World War II or something, and if I remember correctly, there's like a colonel or something who's in an open field and gets flayed alive with like oh. a samurai sword or something awful, uh, and it goes on for way too long. <laughs> There's another guy gets his legs broken and thrown in a well, and he's, just, he's supposed to die, but he doesn't die, I don't think. Uh, you're going to like that book. It's, yeah. it's very difficult at times, because it, that's one of those ones that's so weird. It's like, boring as fuck, but super interesting. <laughs> that was like, and that was the first Mirakami I ever read. Bad way to get into it. It's like going into It or The Stand or something for yeah, Stephen King. Or the, what I did, I fucking started with the dog yeah, power. Don't, like, do that. <laughs> don't do that, folks. Yeah, but 1Q84 is awesome. I think, well, the problem with it is, is, like, the main thing is the reiteration of old information because it was actually in Japan, three books, I believe. Yeah. Over here, they put it in one. I'm glad they released it into that three yeah. book collection of the, like, the one I got for uh, Christmas or whatever because that book, like, you, it's a like comic book. Sometimes you get to, like, the next book book like book two and it's reiterating a bunch like, of shit from the first one. Oh, last time yeah so it's like yeah but it's like chapters long uh but it's really weird and it's very interesting as most things mirakami mirakami are uh but we thank you for listening uh next week we will be doing should we do an introduction for i don't think we need to for uh pinball I don't think we need an introduction. We'll just do yeah. it right because we did the introduction. It's kind of for both. Yeah. Uh, because so, there's not a second introduction in here for that one, is there? I think there might be a mini one. That's what again. I couldn't tell if it was like an introduction or if it was part of the story. So you you'll have to let me know once you once you read it what what you think. I'll read it first, and then we can go from there. Yeah. Uh, either way, folks, we'll be covering Pinball 1973 by Haruki Mirakami next. I wish we could have had a multi-part episode for this, but like I said, this is almost a short story. Yeah. Uh, it's only 100 pages. The other one's 100. The pinball is 130-something pages, so it's a little longer, but I'd imagine we'll still fly yeah, right through it. Yeah, it's still probably going to be just an issue. Yeah, and in the future, if we do a wild uh, sheep chase, we will make sure we break that up, and that's a full novel. We can break that up and do ad nauseum, just yeah. continuous episodes until the fans hate our guts. Um, An episode of chapter. Yeah, I did not release the first... Well, as of recording this, we had last week's episode recorded. I'm going to wait till next week to release that. So we'll be a week ahead on everything. Uh, that's just because of laziness. Yeah. So we're well, for- making sure that we have it done. So it's no delay for the listeners. Yeah. What you said there sounds better. Well, we keep having fucking guests on the show. 
Uh, so anyway, folks, we thank those, you for listening. Those assholes who want to be on our podcast. <laughs> but not on a mere calming minute. No. This is just our thing. Just us. Just us, buddy. Uh, thank you for listening, and we will check you next week. <laughs>